Hello, everybody, and welcome. It's wonderful to be able to spend some time with you all today and to talk about our climate futures and how we can unlock more positive visions for the world we actually want to live in. My name is Ed Finn. I'm the director of the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University. I'm also the academic director of Future Tense uh, and really excited about this program we have for you today. I want to start by talking a little bit about how this really amazing group of people came together uh, and the project that uh, we are, are leading uh, to address the issues that we're going to be talking about today, the Climate Imagination Fellowship. So this started for us as a, a conversation about our, our growing uh, unhappiness with this, this collective challenge we face. How do we catalyze affirmative climate action in the present? Uh, I'm sure that you all are aware of the traumatic climate events happening every week. It seems like there's another uh, hurricane or forest fire or superstorm or drought. Uh, and many of these challenges don't really go away. They just leave the headlines and they persist as uh, ongoing challenges. And it's clear that these challenges are only going to get worse. Uh, and perhaps naturally, people all over the world often feel sort of powerless in the face of these changes, right? We have a sense of fear and anxiety about climate stress and these growing futures, uh, the, these, the, this, this sort of looming um, dystopian future that seems to be ahead of us. Um, but as uh, one of our panelists reminded me in our, in our conversation right before this, Amitav Ghosh and many others have argued that what we are dealing with here is a failure of imagination that we can only seem to see the problems ahead of us. And we're not even really grappling with the problems, we're just talking about them. Uh, and that what we need to motivate systemic change, transformative change is more positive futures about where we want to go instead of just what we're worried about where we don't wanna go. So our Climate Imagination Fellowship takes this challenge on to ask how we can redefine human and interspecies narratives, stories, visions of the future that are built on more sustainable foundations. How are we not just gonna survive, but thrive in the coming century? So uh, what we're trying to do is create visions of positive climate futures that uh, model cooperation and coordinated action that are rooted in local complexities uh, that are based in reality. They're not all sunshine and unicorns. They you know, effectively model and maintain fidelity to all of the challenges inherent in the human condition and all of the problems, the real problems that we have. Um, but there's still stories that are optimistic and they're grounded in real science. So they're extrapolations from where we are and asking ourselves, where could we get to? So uh, important to us is not just that we come up with a few stories that and, and say, well, this is it. This is this is the set of answers. We've, we've solved this problem because that's not really going to happen. Uh, but what we are going to do is model how you do this kind of storytelling. So our, our ultimate goal is not just to come up with these visions of the future, but to inspire communities and individuals, young people around the world to start imagining their own positive climate futures. What does a climate future look like for, for you in your community? Uh, and I think to do that, we have to begin with this attitude of possibility, this attitude of change. Um, and recognize that the most important tool we have to do this is storytelling, that stories are a way that we can inspire different pathways, we can inspire different causal relationships, and it's one of the few tools we have as humans to grapple with the complexity of climate change. We're pretty bad at math and statistics and risk assessment as, as humans, uh, but we're pretty good at storytelling, and we use stories to balance foreground and background ambiguity and complexity. And so for all these reasons, uh, we're really excited to have this a group of Climate Imagination Fellows, and we'll be meeting three of them today. Um, so the, the structure of this project is that we have four fellows from all over the world. Uh, they are creating uh, novelette length climate futures narratives, as well as flash fiction stories, and they're incorporating input from researchers, from policymakers, community members, leaders across a whole variety of different fields. Uh, and we're doing a series of events. This is one of them leading up to uh, uh, TED's Project Countdown and COP26, the next major meeting of the Congress of Parties for the International Climate Accords. Uh, and all of this will culminate in a, a project of, of publication next year. We're calling the Climate Action Almanac that will collect all of these different materials, fiction, nonfiction, interviews, do-it-yourself activities, and more. 
Uh, and we're doing all of this uh, in collaboration with an amazing group of partners, including the, the UN High Level Climate Champions Team, uh, TED Countdown, Climate Works Foundation. The Climate Works Foundation is supporting this work. And, uh, and you know, most importantly of all, our four fellows, Libya Brenda, Hana Onogue, Vandana Singh, and Jia Jia, uh, and our, our advisor, and in many ways, the sort of spiritual inspiration for this project, Kim Stanley Robinson, whose new novel, uh, Ministry for the Future, has really fired this conversation for many others as well, and is an extended experiment in exactly what I'm talking about. How do you imagine a positive climate future uh, that is grounded in the world as it is today and projects forward to hopefully inspire us towards real change. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, the participants in our first panel. Kim Stanley Robinson is a novelist and winner of the Hugo Nebula and Locus Awards. He has written more than 20 books, including the Mars Trilogy, Green Earth, and Aurora. His latest novel, The Ministry for the Future, imagines a new transnational agency that advocates for the rights of future generations amidst escalating climate chaos. Bina Venkataraman is an American journalist, author, and science policy expert. She is currently the editorial page editor at the Boston Globe. She also teaches in the program on science, technology, and society at MIT. She is the author of The Optimist Telescope, Thinking Ahead in a Reckless Age, which is a book near and dear to my heart. Uh, she served as senior advisor for climate change innovation in the Obama White House. And finally, in our first panel, uh, Nigel Topping is the UN High Level Champion for Climate Action for the United Kingdom. He works to mobilize climate action by connecting the work of governments with voluntary and collaborative actions taken by cities, regions, businesses, investors, and local communities. Previously, he was the CEO of We Mean Business, where he drove collaboration for climate action among NGOs, working with the world's most influential businesses. He is a commissioner on the Energy Transitions Commission, a global coalition working toward net zero emissions. We're really delighted that uh, Nigel can join us here today as well. So uh, let me dive in here. Um, so in August, we saw the, you know, the most dire report yet from the IPCC. Uh, innumerable scientists, experts, and activists have been sounding this alarm for, for decades now. Uh, the ravages of the climate crisis are unfolding before our eyes. Uh, what is the role of positive climate futures in this effort to reduce global emissions, to transform our economies? Uh, where do stories of hope, imagination, and inspiration come in? Um, Stan, do you want to kick us off? Sure. And, and thank you, Ed, uh, for gathering us. Um, we all humans have a sense of their future. They're always, we are always planning. It's one of the things that distinguishes us as a species is that we can imagine futures. So given the situation that we're in now, there is a best case scenario going forward or a range of scenarios and some of them are better and some of them are worse. If the cultural imaginary doesn't express the best case scenarios then the assumption of all of us in general is that there isn't such a thing that essentially we are already uh, doomed to a terrible fate but it isn't true i want to uh, uh, truncate this by saying that um, the media is imagine history as a kind of a tide um, um, an estuary a river running into the sea some some um, nautical or um, uh, riverine metaphor like that, there, there's a lot of chop on the surface because of social media and the world today. And a lot of that is foam. And then what is interesting to contemplate is the underlying tide of history, which would include science and diplomacy, people working hard to make it go in a certain direction, a good direction. Um, so maybe it's important to ignore the froth and the surface chop and focus on the underlying tide where enormous advances are being made and the potential, the potential is there to get to a best case scenario, even given the dire straits that we're in right now. We have to tell that story too. We have to get below the surface to the deeper movement of history and hope that it'll take us in the right direction. You know, maybe we me turn to you because you have thought about some of these larger, the, the large scale question of optimism in your work. Uh, how do you see the, the, that playing out in, in climate? 
Well, yeah. So, I mean, I really came at this um, when I was researching the Optimist Telescope from the perspective of what inspires human beings to act on problems or opportunities of the future, what actually allows us to make that leap from merely planning or plotting for the future, as Stan was saying, to actually taking the future far more seriously, uh, which I think is something we really need to do when it comes to climate change. And as Stan was saying, you know, we are, right, we have this unique superpower as a species to contemplate the future. But our imagination is constrained uh, by sort of the evolutionary purpose for one of, of conjuring the future. It's largely based on our episodic memory. So episodes in our past, uh, we are constrained uh, to Kim's point about the, the sort of surface noise, um, which I'm very much a participant in doing as a journalist today and, and activating our concern about the immediate that um, reinforces for us uh, the sense that what is happening right now is what is possible in the future. And really what we need to be able to do is expand our view of the future to, in order to be what I think of as pragmatic or practical optimists who are working towards a better future, we need to be able to expand that notion of what's possible in the future. And there are a few things, I guess really three things that I would point to as sort of components of imagining the future that are really important. Uh, the first is that imagining the future is not just about uh, predicting the future. So we give people information about climate change all the time and we expect that to somehow galvanize them into action, um, telling people that the sea level is going to rise two to five feet within a certain number of decades, telling people that the temperature is gonna rise by an average number of degrees. And what's been often missing from that conversation, which has driven both the scientific and the policy and political conversation about climate change, is to me, I think of it as imaginative empathy um, has been missing from that conversation. So um, one of the things I write about in the Optimist Telescope is um, the Munich Olympics and the sort of scenario planning that was done for that in 1972 is really elaborate scenario planning, because I think often we're using scenario planning when we talk about climate futures. And there were all of these reasons why, even though a perfectly uh, construed scenario of what actually happened there, which was a terrorist attack, you can look it up if you want more of the details, um, were ignored. And, and it goes to this point of, um, if you have information about a future scenario, but you're unable to really contemplate and empathize with yourself having to face that scenario or with other human beings, future generations having to face that scenario, it's going to be very difficult for you to cross into the realm of acting and caring about that more than that immediate um, surface rippling, more than that immediate urgent demand that's in front of you today, whether it's putting food on your table uh, or something in the realm of your professional life, that's um, your piles of emails. So we have to really think about um, bringing in empathy. And I think that is where storytelling, um, like Stan's work, um, like the work of so many cli-fi authors today, uh, is really populating a space where we can be more empathetic. There are other tools than storytelling, like writing a letter to your future self or future child, even virtual reality that can help, I think, bridge that um, imaginative gap in terms of really empathizing with the future in a way that we don't um, when we merely look at climate scenarios. Um, the other aspect with that, which I think, Ed, you, you mentioned in your introductory remarks um, is about uh, you said powerlessness, and I almost think of sort of the opposite of that as feeling a sense of agency to affect the future. So we know from looking at the behavioral science that when people think that they have no ability to affect the trajectory of the future, it's very disempowering. And, you know, you can feel like, well, why not, why not just party like there's no tomorrow if I can't affect this future anyway? Um, and so when thinking about how we paint the future and create um, ideas of the future, it's important to be able to show how individual people and how people, particularly in community, can change the direction and the course of history, which remains true as dire as the climate predictions are today. Um, and lastly, what I think this conversation is about is um, being able to imagine not just climate futures that are doomsday, but climate futures that actually make society better than it is today and better than we've known it in the past. So being able to imagine where we go as a society. Does our society become more cohesive? Do neighborhoods become cleaner and safer? Can we show people a world in which um, 
taking better care of the oceans and the resources in the oceans also makes life uh, more rich and exciting? Can we show people the wonder and awe of living on a planet that is thriving? I think that's a really wonderful perspective. And I think uh, we have to want these things. We have to want this future. We have to be excited about it and believe in it. Uh, and I really love that both of you mentioned uh, the people, the, the individual people, you know, whether they're the people who are working really hard to try and swing the, the arc of history in the right direction, or uh, this idea of imaginative empathy, which I uh, am, a, am a really strong believer in as well, Bina. So, uh, Nigel, you have this unique perspective because you have really been working with people in, you know, in the trenches, as it were, and, and, and trying to, trying to uh, think about some of these changes and enact them. So uh, how do you see the role of storytelling in, in your work from, from your perspective? Well, I'm, I really, I want to pick up on Bina's um, reflections on agency, because I, to me, this is at the heart of it. I think that, um, I mean, I'm really com compelled by George Soros's description of what he calls reflexive futures, like the future that we see um, affects our choices today. So there's a relationship between our expectations of the future and our actions today. And, um, and what I think often happens is we fall between two, um, two standard stories, which aren't really stories, actually, to your point, Bina, they're more sort of dry descriptions of the future, which, which leave us with no agency. The ones what I, the ones what I call gloom porn, which is just like, you know, have you heard how screwed we are, right? You know, it's just like going on and on and on and on about, and it basically gets to the point where there's nothing we can do. So this is a kind of, you know, party like there's no tomorrow or, or, or just prepare for survivalism, you know? So it's a, there's no agency about changing the future. It's just accepting a terrible future um, and dealing with it. I mean, that's, for me, that's, 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 that's an incredibly dangerous. And I think people who promulgate that scenario are, are evil right? because they're actually saying to people give up hope don't do anything allow billions to die i've just been visiting some small island communities right they don't they're not giving up and they don't and and and, and you know and if we have any human empathy then we shouldn't be giving up absolutely um nevertheless a little bit of that i mean and stan starts his book ministry for the future with quite a quite a dose of gloom right so i think you have, you have it's not like so you don't want to be um the other extreme, which is what I'd say, is sort of tech utopia, which is like, hey, don't worry about it. We've solved every problem in the past. We'll solve every problem in the future. Just leave it to Silicon Valley and the tech whizzes, right? That equally, there's no agency there. It's like, oh, I don't have to do anything because the tech guys will fix it, right? Um, so I think between gloom porn and tech utopia, there's these more sort of pragmatic, messy descriptions of the future and past. And I think one of the one of the things that gives real, I mean, the key to agency is choice, right? So I think the successful literature or stories of the future that we're talking about are ones which make us think and say, oh, I never thought about that. Maybe we can organize business differently or maybe there's different types of money or maybe, um, you know, or, you know, just or maybe dot, dot, dot. <laughs> that, then we're starting to open up the agency of choosing to believe in a different possibility and therefore acting in a different direction. So I think that I think it's really it's, it's about opening up agency so that we can choose different futures and just, just not accept what someone else tells us is inevitable. Yeah. And so, uh, by the way, I want to just uh, let everybody in the audience know that we do have a little bit of time for Q&A. So if you have a question for this first panel, we'll do a couple of minutes of Q&A uh, immediately uh, right after this in, in a few more minutes. Uh, so feel free to drop a question into the Q&A box on your screen. Um, so uh, I think that with agency, also comes this notion of responsibility, right? That they have to work together and that uh, choices um, have consequences and not making a choice is also a kind of choice. Uh, and I wanna uh, ask you about this sort of pragmatic role of storytelling. How, you know, let's say we've, we've passed this first gate of motivating people to say, look, we need to work towards a better future. Um, how do we actually get to positive climate futures? You know, the, the social, uh, and, and collective transformations involved in actually trying to navigate all of these challenges. There are, going to, there are going to be hardships, there will be inconveniences, uh, there will be shifting industries, there will be you know, new jobs and jobs disappearing. 
Um, the physical world will clearly have to change. The human world, the, 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 the world that we've constructed will need to change. So can narratives help us explore and design pathways from where we are to where we need to get to? What role do stories play in this more pragmatic mapping out of change? Um, Stan, why don't we go back to you? Sure. It occurred to me a, a decade or so ago that a plot for a narrative is simply something going wrong. So when we read fiction, which is what I do, you read for two things. It's a kind of anthrop anthropology. Of what is it like to be in a different time and place? And in, in my case, often a future time and place, so it's imagined. But if you were doing the past, it would be the same or somewhere else on the earth. So anthropology, but combined with uh, the puzzle of a, say a detective story, something's gone wrong. How can we set it right? So climate narratives are uh, weirdly um, uh, well mapped by the structure of detective stories in particular, but also just fiction in general. We've got our plot, something's gone wrong. It has to be solved. Therefore you have agents, you have uh, characters from the, uh, the inspector um, trying to uh, solve the problem or the high champion uh, or you have the ordinary uh, person who's been caught up in it, anybody caught up in this problem uh, that actually they're, they're, um, they're snagged in it and, they're, and they're, their lives are affected by it. And for sure, the pandemic has taught us all that uh, world events can snag your life and drag you in directions you didn't really want to go and you have to solve that problem. So um, since this is an underlying structure for so many narratives anyway, and we have this problem smacking us in the face that is, as you pointed out in your introductory remarks, is less and less possible to avoid mentally and physically. Um, the, the, the automatic result is going to be climate fiction. There will be a proliferation of stories about the various aspects of this problem because it has local, regional, national, and then global effects all across the board. It's no uh, coincidence that climate fiction has come about. It's the realism of our time to cope with uh, a, a humanity that is um, at this point poorly adapted to the biosphere by our habits previous, but that can change. So the solutions are there. So, so really we're gonna see a lot more of this and hopefully it will be inspiring to people. I think uh, climate fiction is, is sort of just what happens when we talk about the weather now. You know, it's inescapable, <laughs> it's just what we're living in. Um, uh, Bina or Nigel, do you wanna add briefly onto what Stan said? Uh, uh, and then I'll turn to questions uh, from the audience. Well, this just got me thinking about like, you know, what are the different narrative structures and tropes that really work um, from a, just a point of view of engaging people in fiction or engaging people in nonfiction for that matter. Um, but also then like, how does that map onto realistic pathways for how we solve this? And I think, you know, part of it is right. Like, of course there's this great, I don't know, the film noir, like detective discovering climate change makes a lot of sense to me from the point of view of like uncovering the, the, the crime or the set of circumstances that no one else sees. And there's certainly a lot of that going on from whether it's what particular oil companies have done to cover this up or um, just understanding the nature of change. Um, but I almost think it's like, this is not like, you know, um, the boy with the thumb in his dike or um, or the film noir detective kind of, of solution that we're moving towards. I think it's like the Muppets save the theater kind of, kind of pathway in terms of the narrative where, um, where the individual is going to maybe be able to solve one part of the climate crisis or do one thing for their community um, or maybe unravel one portion of the scientific mystery of climate change. But when it actually comes to how we're going to address this over time, it's going to be, right, it's going to be with other people. And I think that there are narratives and, um, you know, narrative tropes out there that really kind of can be drawn upon to show that that's true. And I think that that disempowering lack of agency we often feel, I think, is because we look at ourselves in isolation relative to the, the scale and proportion and 
um, really um, scariness of this crisis and how it's going to manifest in our communities. And we don't recognize that we are actually more than just isolated islands, even in a pandemic where we're all social distancing. We are, right, we exist in community. We all affect, you know, multiple orders of people uh, beyond us. And that there's a sort of excitement and beauty to coming together with people to solve problems. And whether you go back and read, you know, about the US civil rights movement in the 60s and how people were working together and the joy that happened um, as a lot, while they were, you know, resisting severe oppression, or you look at um, fictional stories where groups of people come together and do things. I think that there's, for me at least, a lot of uh, potential inspiration in offering pathways to getting to climate solutions that don't involve just being the lone Cassandra or the lone um, warrior. Uh, because I often think that that's, that's part of what exhausts those of us who are in this space working on climate change, just being, feeling alone. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure we have a time for at least a couple of questions because I know we have some time constraints with, with some of our panelists. Um, so uh, maybe Nigel, you'd like to, to take a shot at this. Uh, how do you build compelling narratives and future scenarios around actions that are positive and a gentle, but they're not exciting? You know, how do you, the things like reducing energy consumption or, or changing the way that we react with commodities, how do, you know, a lot of the things we need to do are gonna be kind of boring. So how do you motivate people around that? And I don't know if that's something that's come up for, for you, Nigel, in, in the business world. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I was thinking a bit about what Stan started by saying in terms of discounting the froth and identifying the underlying. Of course, it seems to me that's the real trick, right? How do we, in narratives, point to underlying trends, which are illustrated in a, in a believable way, right? Because otherwise it just, it just feels like fantasy and then no one engages with it. It doesn't give us agency. I mean, I, 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 I'm not a fiction writer, although I think I'm spending most of my time telling stories about the future. And I'm trying to do it in a really compelling way. I think of myself more as a systems entrepreneur. And actually, I've been thinking that often that's what entrepreneurs do. is like they're telling stories of the future to future customers or future regulators or, 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 or investors. And whether or not people believe the stories depends on whether or not, you know, and ultimately, the story's got to be backed up with reality, right? You can't keep saying I've invented such and such a gadget without actually producing it and having someone use it. So I think a lot of the key is how do you inject the little factoids which people can recognize as having truth in them. So I spend a lot of my time looking for evidence of an underlying trend that often is not being picked up by mainstream media or by the normal kind of Pareto mindset of managers who look for what are the three big things that are defining the future. Um, and then I, then I try and scare people by saying, dude, this is happening really fast and everything that's ever changed has gone exponential. And if you're not, I mean, if I'm talking to business people or, or, or policymakers, I'm like, you're not going to be elected or you're, you're not going to be competitive. So a lot of it, I think, is about finding the credible early signs of change. And then as Venus has stitched them into a pathway, which takes us to a much more attractive future. Um, that's not the same as making green hydrogen exciting for the average person on the street. I, I think I, I think that's maybe too much of a stretch, but I think you can make exciting the idea that actually we know how to live, a, live in a world where we have plenty of energy without burning fossil fuels. And, and we've already figured out the pathways and, and you can say, look, and here's this new steel plant being built in Northern Sweden right now that's going to make 5 million tonnes of green steel from hydrogen that's produced using renewable energy. And you can point to the news story and they say, look, you start going exponential there, and in 30 years, we're not burning any coal for, to, to make steel. So I think it's about finding credible facts and then sp stitching them into a story that takes us to a very different future. Now, I know uh, somebody needs to disappear. Is that correct at the half hour, or do, we, do you have time for one more question? Yes? OK. I'm going to just throw this out for all of you. Um, how can these salvageable future climate narratives be used to mobilize not only individuals, but also sectors of society, like foundations, higher education, government funding agencies. And I want to uh, shout out uh, Samuel Churtle asked the last question on Zoom, and Laura Pedrick asks this one on Zoom. Well, I mean, I think Nigel, in part, just gave a, a great response to this question, because I think, you know, there's this question of how do you go from the narrative to sort of motivating particular 
actions in particular sectors. And I want to be a little bit careful here of putting too much pressure on, and I think this goes beyond fiction writers, this is really artists, right? Like there are a, a lot of creative people who can help populate our imagination of different kinds of climate futures and different kinds of futures on the planet. Um, and, but I also don't think we should necessarily lean on artists too heavily to then make that leap uh, to translating it into action in part because I think um, when art gets too didactic or when art gets too uh, belabored by trying to drive actual progress, it loses some of what it actually has to offer us, right? Which is the sense of like really revealing to us and um, helping us explore what it is to be human and what it is to be alive on this planet. And, and so I would just hate for us to like layer that all on to every cli-fi writer out there who might be watching this or thinking about this. Um, uh, but at the same time, I do think, right, like, why aren't we bringing in more possibilities of how we imagine the future into these conversations that happen? You know, I've sat with business leaders and with government leaders um, from all over the world to talk about climate change. And mostly what we've focused on are those doomsday scenarios. What happens when you have a heat wave? and the elderly in your city are really vulnerable. Where are you gonna put your cooling centers? Where are you gonna do this? And why not take some of the information about what we know about social resilience, for example, and say, look at this community, for example, in the nineties, we know there was a neighborhood in Chicago that did really well in a heat wave at preventing deaths of the elderly. And why was that? It was because people knew each other and understood each other. And, knew knew the older people and the vulnerable people in their neighborhoods. There were a lot of um, locally owned businesses, what Eric Klinenberg, the sociologist calls social infrastructure. Um, how do we populate an image of a neighborhood that does really well in a heat wave? If, if someone has imagined that, if there's a writer who's imagined that, if there's an artist who's imagined that, can we bring that into this, these kinds of conversations where we are trying to help city planners or um, industry leaders or even, you know, the COP, the countries coming together uh, globally to make decisions about, um, about their climate change commitments uh, so that we are bringing into this space, uh, not just what they're trying to avoid, but actually what they're trying to do. And, and in studying social movements and sort of how they achieve change, I think part of what we learn is that people are motivated by having a dream, right? knowing you can imagining right black and white school children going to school together motivates you more than simply the act of resisting um, violence or oppression and i think the same can apply with climate change where if people can get their heads around some of these climate futures in these fora it could do a lot to motivate people to make more substantial change really like that idea of thinking about this also as culture change a kind of sea change and that it needs to happen at all of these different levels in order to to really be successful. Um, and again, stories are such an important part of that because we can all write ourselves into the story. Uh, Bina, Nigel, Stan, thank you so much for being part of this panel. Uh, and I'm sorry we didn't have there are a lot of fantastic questions. I'm sorry we couldn't have uh, just detained you all day to ask them all. Um, but I wanna transition to our, our uh, climate fellows now. Um, so uh, let me introduce them briefly and then we'll have a discussion with them. Libya Brenda is a writer, editor, and translator based in Mexico City. She writes fiction as well as nonfiction and criticism about science fiction and fantastic literature. She co-founded the, the Cumulo de Tesla Collective, a multidisciplinary working group that promotes dialogue between the arts and sciences and Mexicona imagination and future, a series of conversations about the future in speculative literature. She was the first Mexican woman to be nominated for a Hugo Award for the bilingual and bicultural anthology, A Larger Reality, or Unida, Una, Una Realidad Más Amplia. Hana Onogue is a writer of fiction and nonfiction based in Yenagoa, Bayelsa State in Southern Nigeria, a region famous for its oil industry. Her short stories have been published in the anthologies, Imagine Africa, 500 and Strange Lands short stories. Her collection Cupid's Catapult was one of 10 manuscripts chosen to kick off the Nigerian Writers Series, an imprint of the Association of Nigerian Authors. She is the winner of the Association of Nigerian Authors Poetry Competition in 2016. And finally, Vandana Singh is a speculative fiction author, a physicist at Framingham State University in Massachusetts, and an interdisciplinary researcher on the climate crisis. Her short story collection, Ambiguity Machines, was a finalist for the Philip K. Dick Award. 
or work on a justice-centered transdisciplinary approach to the climate crisis as part of a forthcoming UNESCO volume charting an SDG 4.7 roadmap for radical transformative change in the midst of climate breakdown. So welcome all of you. Uh, it's nice to, to see everybody, as I said before, you know, this, uh, so much of our work is virtual now, so it's nice to have these, these gatherings and convenings. So uh, for this project, you're all engaged in creating these new positively inflected stories about climate futures. We've tasked you, all everything we've just been talking about, we've asked you to take on as a, you know, a writing prompt. Uh, how do you integrate climate science, emerging technologies into your stories, as well as information about local communities and cultures, physical geographies, everything else? Uh, what knowledge and information goes into making a good story about the climate crisis and our responses to it? Uh, Vandana, would you like to start? You're, you're muted. Oh, there you are. Sure, thank you. Um, and uh, I just want to reiterate what a pleasure it is to be among you all. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so this this big question. Well, uh, first I want to I want to nudge at this term positive and to reiterate. In fact, Nigel said something similar that uh, what I construe as positive is uh, is is a kind of positivity that does not deny the reality of climate change and the unfolding ap apocalypse that marginalized people in particular have been going through for a long time, but one that actually engages with the experiences of people in those communities and then tries to figure out, okay, how do we, how do we get creative? How do we, how do we find ways out of there? Um, so what are, what I'm gonna to try to describe is my perspective, uh, uh, which, is, which is positive in this sense. Um, and also uh, part of it has to do with listening closely to real world stories and particularly with real world stories of marginalized people um, in, in locations that are climate vulnerable. Um, and to me, it's like uh, the climate science part of it, of course, which is something that I, uh, you know, I consider myself a climate translator as a physicist who, who teaches climate change in my classes. Uh, and so the question of what is essential for everyone to know about climate change is really interesting. Um, and to me, those essential points have to do with, you know, the imbalance in the carbon cycle, the fact that climate change is not our only problem, but is intimately entwined with inequality, with biodiversity loss, with the, uh, uh, with the you know, imbalance in the nitrogen cycle, all of those other factors. So I see climate change as an accelerant on a house that's already on fire. So we have to pay immediate attention to it, but we cannot ignore the fire that's been burning for the longer time. Um, so the way I see it, and I'll, I'll end with this, is that um, often people simply um, default to the techno fix as, as the way that you look at, um, you know, kind of solving the climate problem. But uh, we cannot simply, we cannot, we often don't look at the context of technology. Who is benefiting? Where is it coming from? Uh, what are its impacts, uh, both on society and on the environment? So for example, we know that electric vehicles, we need to switch to electric vehicles. There's no doubt about that. But can we simply replace fossil fuel vehicles with electric vehicles without changing the socioeconomic structure? I mean, if we do that, we are talking about mining the ocean. We are talking about uh, you know, increasing perhaps fourfold the amount of mining we do for, for the materials, for the EV batteries. So uh, what I really want to do is to take the power of fiction, which I see in two ways, um, to, to kind of like, firstly, ask those what if questions, like what if technology arose from the needs of people instead of being imposed on us top down by systems of power? What if, um, what if we had, you know, and so, so I, I look at a lot at the low tech that already exists in cultures, which we don't think of as technologies. And finally, um, the power of fiction is not really, and this echoes what Bina just said, that it's, it's not so much to come up with blueprints for the future, although I do think that it can give us ideas and ways of thinking. The power of fiction, speculative fiction in particular for me, is to put us in a different headspace, to immerse us in an alternate reality where we suddenly see the world in a completely different way. 
So. Hannah, how do you, what about you? How do you think about this, uh, this question of storytelling when we're also trying to draw in all of these different ideas, different fields of knowledge, or even you might think of them as practices and methods. And as, as Vandana was saying, also uh, knowledge that you know, might not be the, the, the top-down uh, sort of uh, Western scientific industrial complex, but other kinds of knowledge. Well, yeah, thank you once again for having me, of having us. For me, from my perspective on this side of <laughs> the world, First of all, we look at what are people willing to do? For instance, when we talk about climate action, I want to use the pandemic as an example. You had the lockdown over here, and then people said, why are we, what's happening? How am I going to earn my daily bread? They don't, they're not able to envision thinking about my health. They're like, I'm going to die anyway. If I stay home, my kids are looking at me, they're expecting food, they're expecting something. And then you say, I should stay home. It's like the, you, you weigh the two and one weighs heavier. So you think of the climate thing and it's like, that's so far off. So you have to get people to look beyond that survival mode of now. And look, in a place like Nigeria, where you have governments and leadership, which is faulty and failing, you think, first, let us try and solve our problems before we start thinking, you think, oh, those are you know, developed country problems. We, we have to start where we are. We, ha we haven't gotten there. They're like, oh, we, we have to <laughs> solve our, we have not, you have this poverty issue, you have power issues. So it's trying to, you know, translate that thing from where you are to where you can be. Like we have oil spills, like in my story, you talk about all these things. Those things are still there. And they're like, okay, so why don't they come and do it? Why don't they come and solve the problem? What are we going to do? We've been, you know, we've been crying out for years. We've been talking about this and we've been complaining and nothing seems to be happening. So why do you think anything we do now is going to make any difference? So it's, it's having to think beyond like, you know, when Bina was talking about, you know, letters to future children and, you know, thinking about, okay, I, I have children who are going to have children and what are they going to inherit? I think that will help, you know, to kind of spark some kind of responsibility or some agency of, okay, if I do this in my little way, then maybe it will make a difference. Thank you. Yeah, I think that question of uh, you th the, the fundamental needs that any human has, we have to think about how we address those as well as asking people to think you know, towards the future. And it's very difficult to think towards the future when you're uncertain, deeply uncertain about what might happen tomorrow or even what might happen today. So I think uh, some really great points. Uh, Libya, I, I'd love to hear you talk about this as well be, uh, because you have created a, a kind of collaborative structure or part of a collaborative structure that I think seems really interesting and, and engages with some of these questions of how you uh, uh, move between art and science, storytelling and other kinds of discourse. So uh, how, what is, how do you think about uh, your work in this, in this relationship? Thank you, Ed, and hello, everybody. Well, first of all, I think um, how Bina was pointing out uh, earlier, sometimes we deal with very heavy concepts and sometimes we feel like a burden. You know, what can you as a writer do to change the world? And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> I just can't read a story. I just can't write stories. Also about earlier, um, you were talking about lack of imagination. And I think that is a key word in this context. Imagination is necessary to do science. Imagination is necessary to write stories. Imagination is necessary to live, actually. As human beings, we need imagination, even to start thinking, what am I going to eat uh, at my lunch hour? I need to imagine it first. And sometimes we, we kind of step up like, so slayamos. I don't know how to translate that word in English. We made aside the idea of imagination as just something escapist, for instance. And I think imagination is a very, very, very powerful tool. And I was thinking, uh, hearing uh, Vandana and Hannah, uh, how in Mexico, for instance, we have to deal with a lot of issues that are not only international and huge, but also we are the product of uh, colonization 
we are now living uh, in this weird place uh, between the late capitalism and our own uh, en environmental issues. So in that context, what can we do? It's probably very little, but it's okay that it's little because we are only humans. We are, I am just one person and I can only do so much uh, and I can only reach so much, but language is a very powerful tool also. And it's a very, I don't like to, um, to ma make uh, uh, like metaphors as, oh, this is a tool or this is a word, but uh, English is my second language. So <laughs> bear with me, please. Anyway, um, about what you were asking specifically, I, I work with a collective of people, scientists and artists and writers uh, from some years now. And it's the best thing it, it can happen to me in my life because uh, I like to say, um, I can, I have a lot of imagination. I can imagine a lot of things in my head, but I am, uh, I'm, I'm just one person. So I, I am finite, I, I have limits. But if I connect with other people, suddenly I became infinite because I, I create this net of ideas, of souls, of, of the conversations. So to work with the Cumulo de Tesla and Mexicona, th these uh, wonderful people here from Mexico that are interested also in science fiction and in art and in sciences, uh, my horizons expand. So we are creating this uh, sort of short fictions about um, a, a what if uh, as a result of the changes and the climate crisis, et cetera, what if one of our volcanoes exploded, the Itzacihuatl, which is uh, near to Popocatépetl, that El Popo is more uh, famous probably, uh, worldly. And uh, kind of uh, the idea is that probably many people get isolated and many people had to, uh, you know, looking for their own resources to survive. And it's about, it's kind of, it kind of reflects what, what is happening uh, in, uh, in the world that is not in Zoom, that is not uh, 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 posting in Twitter on the internet, daily lives that are affected by uh, real problems that seem small, but at the same time reflects what is happening in, in the whole world. Right now, we live in a, we live in a moment in history that we feel the necessity slash obligation probably to be connected with all the world. And we feel that when we speak, even if I just tweet that I make cookies, I have the illusion that I am speaking to a very large audience. 100 years ago, everybody knew that their voices were limited, that their voices were just like, you know, you can hear me, and probably if I read, if I write something, someone can read it. But now we have this idea of the global communication. So I think we can learn uh, from you know just listen to little voices and and observing what is around us and trying to uh, be conscious about where and how we are living right now in this point in history. And <laughs> just to finish, I, I was thinking right now that listen to everybody, uh, I was remembering Gabriela Damian Mirabete, another Mexican writer, which is part of this collective group. She was talking lately a lot about hyperstition, uh, which is this kind of concept in which you can, it's a sort of very reductive, reductively, it's sort of a, prophecy that you write in order to uh, become truth. So if we are imagining the future of the people that is going to read us from, the, I don't know, 20 years from now, what we are reflecting. If we as uh, science fiction speculative writers are reflecting our world, what we are building, what we are imagining. And that I think it's a very interesting question. So the local resources, are uh, way more important than the global resources. You know, the, the local communities and, and, and the, the way of doing things, I think is more important to see, for instance, I don't know, in Mexico, how people had been cultivating the, the uh, earth from centuries before colonialism. Maybe there is some answers there, 
it's not going to be the answer that solves anything, everything. I'm sorry, but I think there is some uh, something very rich in there that we are able to now uh, comprehend in another way. I don't know if- yeah, I, I think that's that. a really great point. And there's so much we can learn from one another that we are not sharing right now. You know, that so much of our, uh, our, our, our communication and, and knowledge structure is very top down or we're very one way and local knowledge and indigenous knowledge and different mm -hmm. practices uh, are, you know, sometimes some, sometimes those, oh, those ideas, those life ways have already been forgotten or they're just sort of tenuously hanging on. And I think it's really uh, important to find ways to empower communities to have those, those voices as well. I wanted to make sure we, we left a little more time for questions for, for you all as well from our audience. Uh, and if you uh, haven't, please feel free to put some questions into the, the Q&A again. Um, but I wanted to ask one from Autumn Poe, which is any advice for graduating students wanting to get involved in the climate change conversation? conversation? I don't know, Vandana, if you have any thoughts about that. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, I think that I think that you know, like like Libya has also mentioned, it's very hard to do things alone. And modern industrial civilization, the globalized culture that so many of us live in, actually just encourages us to be isolated, to be individualistic. So I would say that yes, first find a movement or a group of some kind, uh, maybe in your neighborhood, maybe in your uh, you know in your job, or maybe in the area. And there are also many uh, groups working with, uh, you know, with this grassroots perspective um, nationally and internationally and work with them and see what you can do to, to give to those, uh, those uh, movements and groups. Uh, but also be aware of the fact that power and power structures historically have generally stood in the way of positive change. So we also need to pay attention to those um, and to, to basically, you know, uh, at the highest levels when conversation takes place about climate change, uh, then we need to interrupt that narrative with, uh, with reality checks. So that's something that students can definitely do. Thank you. So uh, I, there's a, another uh, question here from Brian Alexander. I'll, I'll leave this open to anybody. Uh, what is the role of colleges and universities in helping the world foresee this crisis and our possible futures in it? Well, I can talk about that, but I don't want to hog the mic here. So please, Livia and Hannah, if you have something to say on that, please go ahead. Uh, not everybody has access to university, first of all. Second of all, uh, as long as uh, the knowledge is circulating, I think uh, it's more interesting to think what questions can you bring and uh, what, uh, yeah, how can you also ask uh, ask things from the the universities or, or, or educational um, structures in order to help to to move things? Because it's not because everything is so vertical right now. Like I have the knowledge, I'm gonna uh, shower over over you, and it's like we need to be more horizontal. That will be. I don't know if it makes any sense as I am saying it, but. I, we need to be more horizontal will be my response. Uh, so I think it, it, that's a great point as well. Um, so I want to ask, well, I guess, Vandana, did you want to jump in as well or? Um, th that's, that's fine. I think uh, I'll just say this much that I think universities and colleges tend to reproduce the status quo, but they need to become, you know, revolutionary forces for change. And that, and the only way to do that, I think, is to break the ivory towers. And as Libya was suggesting, to grow more horizontal, to engage with communities. So uh, uh, again, I think that's a really great point. Uh, this next question, I think uh, maybe Hannah, you could take on: Has can poetry or literature be a great way of empowering and involving people in environment improvement? Yes, thank you. Yes, I think it can. And we talking about imagination and how it's so important to think, to actually imagine a possible future. 
So for me, just to even um, harness what we've talked about for young people, not everybody's in university, but like what, what happened in Nigeria last year, cut across whether you're in school or not. I don't know if you heard about an NSARS protest that took place. There were, it had illiterate people in quotes. It had student, college um, age students. It had some older secondary school students. So it cut across when you have that need of, okay, this is our issue. How are we going to you know, come together to solve it? I think poetry, a lot of people, and a lot of those people they are on in the internet, they are in social media. That is how they got word across. That is how they communicated with each other. That is also how they can inspire each other. Poetry and fiction can do that. And it will cut across as long as you can hear a language and it doesn't have to be English. You know, we have, um, even in, with, with the pandemic, you had, you know, you're sending out messages in people's local languages so they can understand and grasp the seriousness of the situation. So it is not, it's not always about education, like you're saying, oh, you go to school and learn this. You hear from your friend, you're like, what is this about? You explain it to them. And it, it brings a better understanding. You're kind of like that missionary, you know, who someone can relate with and oh, why are you doing this? It's for so and so, this is for the environment. And they can have a better understanding than if it's cloaked in big English and long words and things that we generally might not, it might take a while to break down. So if you have, um, if you come down to people's levels and communicate to them in a language they understand, it might be poetry, it might be the local storytelling that, you know, it might, it's not as, as it used to be with them, the advent of TV and other media, but you still have some oral tales that you tell, you know, people here in villages and all that. Such storytelling can connect with more people to give them more of an understanding of why they need to act and why it's important, not just to think, oh, well, we're doomed anyway, so what is my little contribution going to do? So I think, yes, it can go a long way in helping with that. Thank you, Hannah, that was uh, beautifully said. And that feels like a really good moment, actually, to, to bring this to a close so that we are on time. I wanna thank all of you for uh, participating today and the tremendous work you're doing with this project. and more generally around climate futures. Uh, it's such a pleasure to, to get to work with all of you. Uh, and I wanna thank everybody for attending. If you'd like to learn more about our project, you can go to climateimagination.org. Uh, you can also see some up, other upcoming events we have on September 7th. We're gonna be doing uh, an event with the Journal of Science Policy and Governance around science policy and climate futures. And on September 22nd, we're gonna be doing a conversation about climate futures with the British Library. Uh, those are both going to be virtual events as well. Uh, you can also check out Kim Stanley Robinson's TED Talk, Remembering Climate Change, a message from the year 2071. Uh, and I'm going to uh, check in with all of our panelists, but uh, uh, Stan at least has offered to respond to some of the other questions uh, over, over a message that we can send out to everybody who RSVP'd later. So uh, if you didn't get your question answered in the, in the panel, uh, maybe there, we'll be able to uh, get, a, get an answer for you and we'll check in to see if anyone else uh, can, can participate in that as well. Um, so I want to end here by just saying thanks again uh, for every, to everybody uh, for participating and joining us, all of the great questions, all of the great thoughts from our panelists. Uh, thank you to our colleagues at Future Tense and the New America Tech team. Thank you to the UN Climate Champions team, to the TED Countdown team, to Climate Works. Uh, that there's such a tremendous uh, coalition of, of people who are excited about this work and, and involved in it. Uh, and it feels like this is the time, this is the moment to be, to be working on this and having these conversations. So thank you all again and have a wonderful day.